Welcome to MedCrime. Today we shall be looking at the physiology of the blood cells. A normal human blood is composed of various types of blood cells. And these blood cells include erythrocytes or red blood cells, white blood cells or leukocytes, and thrombocytes or platelets. The site of the formation of these blood cells varies from age to age, and during early embryonic period, the yolk sac is the principal site of blood cell formation. In the fetal period, the liver and the spleen takes over, and in the children, this blood cell formation takes place in all bones, and by the age of 20 years, the upper end of the humerus, the femur, and in flat bones, for example the sternum, pelvis, and vertebra, is involved in blood cell formation. During emergencies, other areas may revert into this formation of blood cells. The process of blood cell formation is called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. These blood cells are formed from what's known as pluripotent stem cells. The pluripotent stem cells are found in the bone marrow, and these cells are capable of multiplying and differentiating into precursor cells that can form all the formed elements of the blood. The stem cells in the red bone marrow produce cells that mature into various types of formed elements. And we have two types of stem cells, the myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. The myeloid stem cells give rise to the red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells, all except lymphocytes. On the other hand, the lymphoid stem cells gives rise to the lymphocytes. However, some of the lymphocytes complete their development in lymphoid tissues which are located outside the bone marrow, for example, the thymus. Let's have a look at the production of the red blood cells. A multipotent stem cell descendant called myeloid stem cell gives rise to erythroblasts. These erythroblasts divide many times and as they mature, they gain molecules of hemoglobin and lose their nucleus and most of the organelles. It is estimated that about 2 million red blood cells are destroyed per second. Therefore, an equal number must be produced to keep the red blood cell count in balance. Erythrocytes or red blood cells are formed from the red bone marrow stem cells. These red blood cells are formed according to the needs of the body. The process of red cell formation is known as erythropoiesis, and this process requires between six to seven days to complete. The kidneys monitor the blood and secrete a hormone known as erythropoietin when oxygen levels in the blood decrease below the normal. When the oxygen content is very low, the liver and other tissues also produce erythropoietin hormone. The erythropoietin hormone stimulates the bone marrow cells that manufacture red blood cells and other than erythropoietin, there are many factors such as protein, iron, folic acid and vitamin B12 which are required for the formation of the red blood cells and their hemoglobin content. Certain hormones, for example growth hormone, eroxin, estrogen and androgen are also required in the red blood cell formation. What are the materials that are needed in the formation of the red blood cells? We require hemopoietic materials for erythropoiesis, for example, iron and protein. And whenever they are reduced, a patient usually presents with anemia. We also require influencing factors of red blood cell maturity, for example, vitamin B12 and folic acid. What is the structure of a red blood cell? Red blood cells are biconcave, they're like donuts, and they do not have a nucleus nor other organelles. They have a diameter of about 7 to 8 micrometers, and a peripheral thickness of about 2.5 micrometers, a central thickness is like 1 micrometer, and a cube is about 90 cubic micrometers. This shape of the red blood cells 
and their small size enables them to squeeze single file through the smallest blood vessels. The biconcave shape of the red blood cell allows them to swell without rupturing if the surrounding environment becomes hypotonic. The red blood cells are responsible for the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the body tissues. This function is achieved by the presence of hemoglobin. And each red blood cell contains about 200 million molecules of hemoglobin. This hemoglobin is the most important component of the red blood cells and has a great affinity or need for oxygen. And hemoglobin has four subunits, and each subunit is made of a heme component and a globin component. The heme, or iron containing porphyrin, is synthesized from succinic acid and glycine. This heme contains one atom of iron in ferrous state, and several types of hemoglobin are present relating to the globin gene. An adult has an alpha and beta chains and the fetus has an alpha and gamma chains which have an increased affinity for oxygen. The heme moiety is unchanged. The lifespan of a red blood cell is approximately 120 days that is about four months and each red blood cell circulates 27 kilometers average in the blood vessels. With, a, with age, red blood cells become more fragile and are destroyed in the liver and the spleen where they are engulfed by macrophages. When red blood cells are broken down, the hemoglobin is released and the globin portion of the hemoglobin is broken down into its component amino acids which are then recycled by the body. The iron from the heme is removed and transported by the protein in the plasma known as transferrin. This iron detaches from transferrin on reaching the tissue, for example the liver, the muscle cells and the spleen, and becomes attached to the iron storage protein known as ferritin and hemosiderin. When this iron is needed, it is released from the storage proteins and transported in the blood to the bone marrow where new cells are formed. The heme portion of the molecule undergoes a chemical degradation and is excreted as bile pigments by the liver into the bile. These bile pigments are bilirubin, which is a greenish yellow pigment, bilivadin, which is a yellow orange pigment. This bilirubin and bilivadin contribute to the color of the feces. The excessive production of bilirubin is responsible for the yellowish discoloration known as jaundice. Let's move ahead to a second type of blood cells known as white blood cells. The white blood cells are derived from the stem cells in the red bone marrow. They too undergo several maturation stages and each type of white blood cell is apparently capable of producing specific growth factor and this growth factor circulates back into the bone marrow to stimulate its own production. The white blood cells differ from the red blood cells in that these white blood cells are larger, they have a nucleus, white blood cells lack hemoglobin and they are translucent unless they are stained. So a white blood cell count are not as many as the red blood cells and they are only about 5,000 to 11,000 per millimeter cubic of blood. What are the types of white blood cells or leukocytes? White blood cells are divided into two types depending on whether they have granules in the cytoplasm or not. Those which have granules are known as granulocytes, and those without granules are known as agranulocytes. The granules in the white blood cell contain various enzymes and proteins which help the white blood cells to defend the body. There are three types of granular leukocytes and two types of agranular leukocytes. 
These types differ somewhat by the size of the cell and the shape of the nucleus and also they differ by their functions. Let us start by looking at the granulocytes. The granulocytes have a lobed nucleus and granules in the cytoplasm take different colors if they are stained. As the granules become older, the nucleus has more and more lobes. And because of the different shapes taken by the lobes, the granulocytes are also known as polymorphs or polymorphonuclear nucleocytes. Certain cells with small granules in their cytoplasm are known as neutrophils. Those with granules that stain pink with acid dyes are known as eosinophils. And those granules that stain blue are known as basophils. Each granulocyte subtype has specific functions which we shall look at. Let's start with the neutrophil. The neutrophils are the most abundant of the white blood cells. They are multilobed nucleus which is joined by nuclear threads known as polymorphonuclei. Some of the granules take up acid stain and some take up a basic stain. And neutrophils are the first type of white blood cells to respond to an infection by a process known as chemotaxis. These neutrophils engulf pathogen during phagocytosis. However, the neutrophils are known to have a short half-life of about 6 hours. Another type of granulocyte is eosinophil. Eosinophils have a bilobed nucleus. Their large and abundant granules take up eosin and become red color, and this accounts for their name eosinophil. Most several functions. Among the several functions, they increase in number in event of a parasitic worm infection, and eosinophils also lessen an allergic reaction by phagocytosing antigen antibody complexes which are involved in allergic or anaphylaxis attack. Then lastly we have the basophils. These basophils have a U-shaped or lobed nucleus. The basophils have granules which take up the basic stain and become dark blue in color accounting for their name known as basophil, basic for basophil. They contain histamine and heparin and they are similar to tissue mast cells. The another type is known as agranulocytes. There are two types of agranulocytes, the lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes have a spherical nucleus and monocytes have a kidney-shaped nucleus. One of the types of agranulocytes is lymphocytes. The lymphocytes consist of cells with large nucleus and a scanty cytoplasm and they are formed in the bone marrow after birth. But some of the mother cells migrate to the lymph nodes, thymus and the spleen and the production of lymphocytes also occurs in these regions of the lymph nodes, thymus and the spleen. Lymphocytes are responsible for specific immunity to a particular pathogen and their toxins and they also produce antibodies or immunoglobulins. On the other hand, we have monocytes, which are the largest of the white blood cells. They are formed in the bone marrow and circulate in blood for 72 hours and enter the tissues to become macrophages. And macrophages phagocytose pathogens, old cells and cellular debris. The macrophage also stimulate other white blood cells, including lymphocytes, to defend the body. What are the functions of granulocytes? Granulocytes contain substances which produce allergic and inflammatory reactions. For example, granules in basophils and eosinophils contain histamine and heparin, which are released whenever someone has an allergic reaction. The substances together with other chemicals are responsible for the symptoms such as redness, swelling, and what are you seen in allergies. And then they have phagocytic properties. For example, the neutrophils seek out bacteria and ingest, killing them. Protein molecules on the bacteria surface help the neutrophils recognize them as foreign. These neutrophils extend limb-like processes from the cytoplasm 
and engulf a foreign agent into the cytoplasm through a process known as phagocytosis. Then they kill and digest the bacteria with a toxic enzyme that is present within the cytoplasmic glanules, and these cells are the first line of defense in bacterial infections. Neutrophils can also enter tissue spaces by squeezing between the endothelial cells of the capillaries through a process known as diapedesis if there is an infection or an inflammation. The chemicals which are secreted by those neutrophils that have already reached the infection site together with products that are released as a result of cell injury attract a number of neutrophils to the infection site through a process known as chemotaxis. Many white blood cells only live a few days. They probably die while engaging with pathogens and others live months or even years. The cells are produced in large quantities by the bone marrow at the time of infection because each cell only lives for about 6 hours. Another type of blood cell is platelets. Platelets are also known as thrombocytes. They are the smallest type of cells in the blood and appear as dust particles under a microscope. Although they are in small in size, they contain granules in their cytoplasm. These platelets are formed by large cells known as megakaryocytes, which are located in the bone marrow, and they are actually pinched off bits of cytoplasm from the megakaryocytes. The platelet formation is stimulated by a hormone known as thrombopoietin. These platelets result from fragmentation of certain large cell types known as megakaryocytes that develop the bone marrow and platelets are produced at a rate of 200 billion platelets per day. The blood contains around 150,000 to 300,000 platelets per millimeter cubic. And because platelets have no nucleus, they last at most 10 days, assuming they are not used sooner than that in hemostasis. What are the functions of platelets? The major platelet function is to prevent blood loss and the platelets are sticky. They collect at the site of injury inside the blood vessels, what is called as platelet aggregation. The platelets then form a plug at the injury site, preventing blood loss. These platelets secrete the contents of the granules at the injury site, and some of these secretions are important in clot formation. The platelet cytoplasm contains actin and myosin, which, if you remember, are the contracted proteins that are found in the muscles. This protein, actin and myosin, contract and help pull the injured edges of the blood vessel together after the site of injury has been plugged in a process known as clot retraction. Let's have a brief overview of hemostasis process. Hemostasis is the process of formation of blood clots in the walls of the damaged blood vessels preventing excess blood loss. This hemostasis is divided into three events, the vascular spasm, platelet plaque formation, and coagulation. The vascular spasm is the initial response of the blood vessel injury. A damage to the blood vessel endothelium exposes collagen to the blood. These platelets stick to the collagen and activate the release of serotonin and serotonin being a strong vasoconstrictor, it constricts the vessels reducing blood flow to the injured area. The second step of hemostasis is platelet plaque formation. This is the process by which platelets adhere to each other to form a platelet plaque that closes minute vascular holes. The platelets comes into contact with collagen fibers in a damaged blood vessel and they are activated to swell, form pseudopods, become contractile and become sticky. This attracts more and more platelets. As part of the normal activities, blood vessels often break and platelet plug is usually sufficient to stop the bleeding. The third process of hemostasis is coagulation or clotting. Coagulation is the process where soluble fibrinogen is converted into insoluble fibrin. The conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin is catalyzed by an enzyme known as thrombin. 
thrombin enzyme is a serine protease that is formed from its circulating precursor known as prothrombin. This is done by the action of activated factor 10, also known as prothrombin activator. The factor 10 can be activated by reaction in either of the two systems, that is the intrinsic system or an extrinsic system. Let's have a look at the intrinsic pathway. The initial reaction in the intrinsic system is the conversion of inactive factor 12 to active factor 12. This occurs when blood is exposed to the collagen fibers that underline the endothelium of the blood vessels. The active factor 12 then activates factor 11 and the active factor 11 activates factor 9. Activated factor 9 forms a complex with the active factor 8 which is activated when it's separated from the von Willebrand factor. The complex formed by activated factor 9 and activated factor 8 activates factor 10. Phospholipids from the aggregated platelets and calcium ions are usually necessary for the full activation of the factor 10. The extrinsic system, on the other hand, is triggered by the release of tissue thromboplastin, which is a protein phospholipid mixture. The thromboplastin activates factor 7. The activated factor 7 activates factor 10 in the presence of calcium ions and phospholipid. The, the extrinsic pathway is usually inhibited by a tissue factor pathway inhibitor which forms a quaternary structure. The extrinsic pathway is inhibited by a tissue factor pathway inhibitor which forms a quaternary structure with TPL, activated factor 7 and activated factor 10. The final common pathway. Prothrombin activator in the presence of calcium, factor 7 and phospholipid catalyze the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. The thrombin acts as enzyme which cleaves fibrinogen into sticky and insoluble fibrin monomer. This process involves the release of two pairs of polypeptides from each fibrinogen molecule. In the presence of factor and calcium ions, the remaining portion fibrin monomer then polymerizes with other monomer molecules to form a stable fibrin. The retraction of the platelet pseudopodia causes the blood group to contract to 40% of the original site, becoming tougher and more elastic. The retraction draws the edges of the wound together, and serum is squeezed from the clot. The coagulation requires many clotting factors and enzymatic reaction. One of these factors is vitamin K, which is found in green vegetables and formed by intestinal bacteria and is necessary for the production of prothrombin. If by chance vitamin K is missing from the diet, someone might develop hemorrhagic bleeding disorders. How does dissolution? of uh, blood clots and inhibition of clotting occur. A clot is destroyed by a breakdown of fibrin through a process known as fibrinolysis and fibrin is broken down by plasmin. This plasmin is formed from plasminogen that is activated by thrombin and plasminogen activator. The plasminogen activators include urokinase and anticlotting factors include heparin, prostacycline and nitric oxide, and thrombomodulin. Heparin results from the mast cells in combination with antithrombin-3, which is a powerful antithrombin. Prostacycline and nitric oxide are from the endothelium, and they reduce platelet aggregation. Then thrombomodulin, that is produced by the endothelial cells, binds to thrombin, and this complex activates protein C, which is a cofactor protein S, and inactivates factor 5 and factor 8. There is a balance between mechanisms that facilitate me 
and mechanisms that inhibit specific function. Both clotting and anti-clotting mechanisms are equally important and a number of these mechanisms are involved in the anti-clotting process. The anti-clotting mechanism include the removal of the clotting factors by the liver and a reduction of the supply of the clotting factors as they get used. Although some enzymes are secreted by platelets, potentiating aggregation of platelets, other enzymes in the blood vessels inhibit the platelet clamping. The antithrombin 3 in the plasma inhibits the active form of clotting factor 9, 10, 11, and factor 12. The endothelial cells and white blood cells secrete a prostacycline, which inhibits platelet addition and platelet release. Mast cells and basophils secrete an anticoagulant heparin. And in addition, there are many other complex mechanisms which inhibit blood clotting. These fibrinolytic or breakdown of fibrin mechanisms also rely on a cascade of reactions that are similar to the clotting mechanism. Some of the factors that are involved in prevention of blood clotting have been isolated and are used to treat individuals with myocardial infarction. Anticoagulants are often given to individuals with a tendency to form thrombus and this anticoagulant work by either inhibiting vitamin K or stimulating the building system that prevents clotting inside blood vessels. A well-known drug is known as heparin and heparin works by facilitating the activity of antithrombin 3 retarding the thrombus formation. Streptokinase is an enzyme that is produced by bacteria and streptokinase is known to be fibrinolytic and often used as an anticoagulant. If blood must be stored outside the body, substances that remove calcium are introduced to prevent blood clotting. But because calcium is important and is involved in muscle contraction, it is not feasible to prevent blood clotting in the human being by calcium removal from the blood when it's inside the body. During this uh, process, there may be an excessive clotting. The formation of clots attached to the walls of blood vessels is known as thrombosis. These clots are known as thrombi. The danger of thrombus formation is the possibility of a dislodgement of bits of these clots or an emboli, which then can travel in circulatory system, blocking major blood vessels and cutting blood supply to important organs, for example the brain or the lungs. An emboli could cause stroke, myocardial infarction or heart attack and other conditions. And this thrombosis tends to occur in areas where blood flow is sluggish, for example the veins of the legs after surgery or a prolonged inactivity or in veins that are injured or those have having irregular cholesterol plaques inside. It could also result from conditions for example atherosclerosis that facilitate coagulation of blood.